Hi. Welcome to Dorchester Community Church. Thank you for joining us online. Service will begin momentarily. Well, good morning. Good to see you at the church this morning. Thanks for coming. First thing I thought I'd mention was we should sing happy birthday. I don't do this for everybody, so don't sit in terror that when it's your birthday, everybody's going to sing happy birthday. But it is Ernie's birthday on the 8th of us. And you were 92. 92. So before we sing happy birthday, why don't you share your news of one of the gifts you got on your birthday. I have a granddaughter from Oshawa, and uh, she had a little baby girl for my birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's sing happy birthday to Ernie. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Go for it. house after church. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Jane just had a heart attack sitting there. Hey guys, it's Matthew Kennedy, a.k.a. M.W. Tornado, with a four-part mini-series on Minecraft. In this series, we're going to explore uh, whether Minecraft is good for your children, how it can be used to teach bl biblical uh, principles, and what lessons can be learned from it. In this episode, we are simply going to learn what Minecraft is and compare Minecraft to currently widely used children's toys. What are the dangers of Minecraft? Then in the upcoming weeks, use Minecraft as a tool to teach simple biblical principles. Minecraft is a game that is built out of blocks. Each block is a meter in length and has properties depending on the type of block it is. Dirt, Stone, wood, sand, lava, water, are, and several ores like gold, iron, and diamonds are some of the block types you can find. Each block type can be used to build identities like tools, objects, and decorations. Plunk down a workbench, create your recipe, and you get different tools that you may need throughout the game. The land is generated by an algorithm called a seed. This means that there is always a new part of the world to explore. Players can customize how the terrain is generated, like how big the biomes are going to be, how high the land is going to be, or how flat it should be. Creative mode allows you to select from a number of different block types. Flying around, you can build whatever you like. In this mode, you never die of hunger. Um, you never hunger or die. Youth can be as creative as their imagination holds. Here I am building the roof of my barn. If you drop a brick to the ground, you're not going to hurt your foot by stepping on it. In this mode, it's very much like a big game of Lego. You piece together all the blocks that you want to make something that comes from your imagination or from a plan. Survival means the player has a certain amount of health and hunger. If they do not heal or eat, they can die. In survival mode, they need to find the materials needed to build stuff like houses, tools, and even grow their food and make items from the food to eat. 
players even need to replenish growth, uh, trees, and plant seeds for the various materials that they may need as well. Now since we have collected some materials, let's make some tools. We go to our workbench, turn wood into planks, turn planks into sticks, and use the sticks and planks to make simple tools like pickaxes and axes. There are multiple recipes that a player can use to make all sorts of neat equipment. Now since we have our new trusty axe, we can go out and chop down trees much easier and quicker. Depending on the materials that you make your axe with depends on how quickly you cut into materials. A wood axe is okay, but an iron axe or a diamond one is much better. A player will need to go down into deep dark caves to mine for their ores. They collect iron, gold, and diamond that they'll need to smelt to make better materials. They smelt it with charcoal. Um, we can then make our furnace with the cobble. Plunk that down. Add our charcoal and our iron to make iron ingots. That helps upgrade our weapons. We are now better prepared to fight off evil in this land. Searching for zombies, for skeletons, for spiders. Oh, and watch out for those creepers. <laughs> they pack a bang. Survive. Oh, you got a creeper. Creeper. <laughs> Oops. Minecraft can be a multiplayer game where you can play with your friends online in the game. You will want to check your children on who they're playing with. Players communicate through chat. Um, this is the one warning that I have is that because it is a, a social program, you want to educate your children on who strangers are. Because even in a game like this, you want to be careful who you talk to. In multiplayer mode, youth are able to chat with each other. Um, the problem with that is you have to educate your children on proper language. Not everybody online is going to speak Christianly. Also teach your kids that n not all people are your friends. Some are strangers. And like in the real world, you do not want to converse with every single stranger that is out there. There are bullies that are out there. There are people that you might not want your youth to hang around with because they can attack and be very mean to you in the game. Minecraft is a fun game that you can build for hours, sometimes too long. Like anything that your kids play with, even Lego, they cannot stay all night building. They have to respect chores, they have to respect the rules of the house. If it is time for chores or for dinner or to go to bed, they should do that. Um, unfortunately, some people get addicted to this game, like any game, even Lego, and they do need discipline on when, what times to play, when to play, and what's more important, like homework or prayer or going to church. Um, there are priorities that need to be set in life. Um, all too often, people can lose sleep if they're building all day long in Minecraft. But is Minecraft evil? No, because youth can also build all day long, all night long, with their Lego or the game systems that they can play. Proper parenting can make this game a very useful game and a, a tool for teaching life principles. In the next few weeks, we're going to learn how Minecraft can teach life lessons. We're also going to learn some Bible stories using the Minecraft interface. Please join us online on the DCC YouTube channel, on the MW Tornado channel, 
And uh, in the service, you can stream online at dcclive.churchonline.org. And we're going to learn some biblical per- principles, and we're going to have a whole lot of fun this month using Minecraft as a tool for biblical learning. Thank you, guys. Until next time, happy hunting and have a wild day. <laughs> Why is there a sheep on top of the... Uh, there's a sheep on top of the building here. How does he climb up there? No, what I... I was already cor- uh, corrected. It's not a workbench, is it? It's a crafting table. These kids know more than me about Minecraft, which is awesome. But uh, we're going to have a whole lot of fun in the coming months. Um, just to mention, again, the bullying. It happens even if you have two kids in the same room playing with Lego. If somebody's bullying you, what's the smart thing to do? Get an adult. Get an adult. What else can you do if somebody's bullying you? You can tell them to stop, or you just walk away. Same thing in that game. It's going to happen. Um, that's why I just mentioned it. Um, anyways, let's pray and before we go off to Sunday school. Um, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to learn about you, more about the Bible, as we go off to Sunday school today and have fun with our teachers. Please bless our teachers that are teaching us, and bless those that are taking care of us today. In your name, amen. You guys can creep on to Sunday school. We come here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our God, our Father, and the Holy Spirit. And we come, and when we come, we come before him um, on his throne. And so uh, join me as we sing, come into the Holy of Holies. Prepare your hearts and minds um, as we take time to honor and glorify our Lord. Come into the Holy of Holies. Enter by the blood of the Lamb. Come into his presence with singing. Worship at the throne of God. Come into the Holy of Holies. Enter by the blood of the Lamb. Come into his presence with singing. Worship at the throne of God, lifting holy hands to the King of Kings. Worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. to the holy of holies enter by the blood of the Lamb come into his presence with singing worship at the throne of God come into the holy of holies enter by the blood of the Lamb come into his presence with At this point in our service, we're taking up our offering and doing announcements. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you out to our church. 
We are located at 3912 Catherine Street. We have a website, www.dccneighbors.ca. If you want to learn more about our church, please check us out online as well. If you want to join us for our service, our services are casual. We are a come as you are, no perfect people allowed kind of culture. So we would like to see you on a Sunday morning. If you have a family and you attend, I want you to know that we have an excellent children's ministry. Every Sunday we have a children's object lesson put on by Matthew Kennedy. And Christine Baruma provides such great leadership for our children's program. I'm sure your kids will like our church. And I'm sure you will too. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Jesus, all for Jesus. just words alone but will you enable our hearts to also follow suit to just lay ourselves before you and recognize that all that comes our way is for the greater good for you work everything together for good for those who trust in you father and so lord here and now we say we place our trust in you and that you may have your way with us wherever that leads. Lord, we know we so often try to manipulate you into ways and being of how we see the situation and what we think is best. And we pray, Lord, that you will forgive us for that. We pray that we may be humble enough to recognize that not everything that we want is good for us. In fact, Lord, I am so thankful there are times where you have not answered our prayers as we have asked. Lord, we just lay before you all the needs and concerns of the con congregation. We pray especially for Mark Taylor. We pray for June. We pray for um, Marlene as she faces surgery in a couple of weeks. Lord, we just lay all of these concerns before you. 
We lift up all the names that are in the bulletin. And there too, Lord, we ask that by your grace and your mercy, by your power, by your love, by your comfort, all the needs may be met. Lord, thank you for being the God who is sovereign. Thank you for being the God who knows our names. Thank you for being the God who sees every tear that falls. Thank you for being the God who rejoices as we rejoice. Thank you for being the God who has taken away our sin. Thank you for being the God who is faithful and true. Thank you for being the God who is gracious, who is loving, who is merciful, who is patient. Lord, thank you for being a God who never gives up on us. And Lord, we just lift up all those um, family members and friends, co-workers who have not come to know you yet. And Lord, we give you... Um, we give you praise for being a patient God, and we ask that you will help us and enable us to move and to act in ways that will lead them to you, Father. May we love them unconditionally as you love us unconditionally. And Lord, we ask that you will be with Dorchester Community Church as we continue to extend out to our community your love and your mercy and your grace. Continue to build us up as you would have us be. Continue to lead us in the path that you want us to walk. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we talked about, to begin the new year off, to consider the idea that we should approach the year with faith. And the Bible says statements like, without faith it's impossible to please God. Makes sense. You need to have faith that there is a God. You need to have faith in who God is. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son. You need to have faith. And then faith works out. It says that we are to walk by faith, walk by faith and not by sight, which is a challenge for us as we go through the year. Faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit leading us. The Holy Spirit guides us, strengthens us. Faith in God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our faith is built and encouraged through all of those things. God at moments gives us faith for situations that are too great for us. And sometimes we just put our faith in him and our trust in him because we know he's faithful, even sometimes when we aren't. One of the things I decided to do for myself this year was I would take a district-sponsored course. And I know that's not important to you, but it is relevant for this morning. Um, I decided to stretch myself and grow myself. You ever do that? Do something that's out of your wheelhouse. Do something that's different. Force yourself to read something different or study something different to discipline yourself. It's great to stretch yourself. It's a good thing. You're never too old to do that. You can teach an old dog new tricks. All right? There's hope for all of us. Okay? So when I was doing some of the prep work for that and reading one of the chapters, I thought, well, this would make a good sermon. So if you hate it, it's the book's fault. If you like it, it's the book's credit. How's that? All right, but the idea this morning I wanted to carry on with, well, how should we face this coming year? When we go to make decisions, what basis should we make those decisions around? And what kind of ideas should we have when we approach circumstances? It's important that you think about some of these things sometimes before you go in. Benjamin Franklin said, do you love life? Then don't squander time. But that's the stuff life is made of. It's interesting. We don't manage our time very well. At the end of our lives, we wish we had more time. We wish we had spent our time differently. Why not be a little wiser and choose how we're going to spend our time? The kind of decisions I want to talk about this morning, in particular spiritual ones, being a pastor, um, because we're in church, and the spiritual decisions we make, I think, affect the trajectory of our life, where we go. If we believe there's a God, if we believe God is real, if we want God to be in our lives, if we believe in Christ and he's our Lord and Savior, then Christ comes first. And that changes the direction of our lives. Because we no longer do the things we want to do, we try to do what Christ wants us to do. We try to live like Christ. What would Jesus do? We try to live in the kingdom, and we try to obey his precepts and principles. And our life changes. The Holy Spirit's work inside of us changes us as well. So the spiritual drives us and 
sets a tone and a direction for us. And what the Lord says to us impresses us. The best way to hear from the Lord is obviously through the Word of God. The commands of God are always there. The direction of God's always there. But there's also moments when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and gives us direction. You ever experience that? You know, you have this sense, and some people describe it as a voice, that you should do this, and you do it, and you realize God was in it. God does direct and speak to us, and, and so we need to be listening for the Spirit of God, because he directs us on an ongoing basis. The most important decision we'll ever make is what we do with God. Why is that important? Because I believe at the end of our lives, we all go and face God, and meet God. And how will we meet God? We should meet him on his terms, the way he wants us to, through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. Anyways, you've heard me talk about that. Today's message is best summed up in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a great passage to remember. Think about what drives you. When you're going through your week and what you're doing in life and where you're going, what drives you? What are you living for? Consider that for a bit, especially at the beginning of the year. We all have different things that turn our crank and different things we're doing, and we all have different purposes in life. Some of us just want to get through the next day. Remember when you had little kids? That's all you can do to get through the next moment. Moms don't go to the bathroom without a break. Remember those days? There's days that we wonder what we're living for. Some of us think that if we work hard and we do our thing and we honor God, we can do anything. All things are possible with God. Things aren't all possible with God. No matter how hard I try, I will never play in the NBA. I will never be able to beat any of them one-on-one, -on -one, no matter how hard I try. No matter how hard I try, I will never be able to outswim Michael Phelps. I can train, I can work hard, I can get my thrift. There are sometimes things we can't do, just because we're not made to do it. There's some of us, when we consider life, and we consider where we're going and the purpose of our lives, we, we think there's a destiny, right? Is life just random events, or is there a plan, is there a destiny? I was destined to do this. I was. You ever have that feeling? You look at your spouse. There you go. Look deep in his eyes or her eyes. I was destined. Go ahead. Have a moment. <laughs> but the destiny has the idea, and I like the idea of destiny in a way, that we are made for something, that life is unfolding according to a plan. And I like to think that God made us with something in mind, and each of us special and unique, with special and unique gifts, and he fashioned and made us like him, and he has a plan for our lives. I see that in the Bible as I read it. So... If there's a plan, then there's a planner. If there's a destiny, then there's a creator who created that destiny. So the first precept I'm thinking about is love the Lord your God with all your heart because God is there. God is always there. Some of us can dream up our own destiny. Sounds fun to us when we think about it. What would life be? What would we want? Money, fame, power, satisfaction. And if we didn't go with the framework that there was a God, then we could create our own destiny and our own life and our own reality and do what we want. In our North American culture, we are curbed. In the church, we are curbed by our culture greatly. And we are materialistic. We are selfish. We are self-centered. Would you agree? It's true, because if you don't like your church, you don't like the style of worship, what do you do? Go find another one. And that's okay. I get that. I, I understand you got needs and all that, but... Some of us are so self-centered that we can't see God possibly not moving every Sunday for us. I, I thought, as a pastor, not every Sunday is for you. You can come and meet God and worship him, but not every message is for you. I'm not that good. Right? I don't think anybody is. So anyways, we are very materialistic and we are very selfish and self-centered. If you don't think so, watch TV for a bit. What's the purpose of all the TV shows? To entertain you? No. What's between the TV shows? Commercials. What do the commercials do? They sell things. And if you buy this, your life will be fulfilled. If you use this shampoo, your hair will be amazing. 
you drive this car, your experience will be out of this world. Because it can drive itself and park itself and to even change its own tires, I'm sure. It's true, isn't it? Not to be cynical, but really, that's part of it. Who sponsors the shows? Who pays for the shows? Anyways, it's just part of that materialistic culture, and it is what it is. If we follow society, then things change. Not too long ago, people saw money and power and reputation as the measuring sticks for success. Now it seems to be more your own personal expression, what gives you satisfaction, what gives you significance. And it's not necessarily money and power anymore or prestige. It's kind of what yourself sat, your, what gives you signif significance as a person. By the way, I think that God gives us significance. God sees us as unique. He sees us made unique. He loves us as individuals, not just corporately. He doesn't see us as a number. He knows us intimately, the best and worst things about us, and we are the most significant person to him. And we all can go to him and be significant because he's God. Some focus on our relationships to keep us happy. Some focus on our accomplishments. If only I could get more friends on Facebook. If I could only get more likes over my 100th witty post, I'd feel good about myself. It's amazing what we focus on. If I just better myself, then some say if I just simplify my life a little more, I'll be happy. We have things that we want to accomplish in our lives. So what the culture sets and presents as an ideal isn't always best. So we need to consider that. Does God want what the culture wants for us? Sometimes I don't think he does. And this thing is just... That's. Yeah, I know, you want me to do the rest of my sermon. Where'd the rest of my sermon go anyways? Where did it go? It's possessed by Satan here. This is very disconcerting. I had a good sermon too. And if I was Doug, I'd just have it all memorized and just stand here. He saved me. No, he saved me. He saved me. He has a copy of it. Matt, you're the best, man. <laughs> Would have been a long morning otherwise for you people. Sushi for Matt, yes. Matt, you're hired again, buddy. One of the greatest Christians that Scripture records is the Apostle Paul. And take a look at Paul's life when he starts to follow the Lord and what happens to this super Christian. Instead of being on a cruise where you can eat all you want, you get shipwrecked. Instead of getting all the accolades and the praise for writing two-thirds of the New Testament and being such a brilliant man, he takes beatings from the religious leaders and other people around him, people who don't understand him. Instead of being eating at his fave restaurant, he goes hungry. Instead of sleeping nights on the best bed, and I don't know what his sleep number would be, he goes sleepless nights. How do we see Paul react to that? I'm a servant of God. I'm God's chosen. Shouldn't I get better than that? He doesn't do that. He realizes that because God's in control and God's leading his life and God's plan is more important than his desires for his life, he finds contentment in all of that. Because God's first and God's kingdom and God's plan works itself out in his life, that's where he gets his fulfillment from his relationship with God. And his purpose comes from doing God's will, not being self-centered. That's contrary to what our society does. Does our purpose for life line up with God's? Again, I believe there's a God. I believe God made us. I think God created us. You see it all the time in creation. You see it in divine intelligence and the way we are made and the marvel of our bodies. But I believe we are all made for God's plan and purposes. Ephesians 2.7 says that his purpose is to show the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness towards us in Christ. And God does show us that. God's fundamental intention for all of us is to love us. To be in a relationship with us because he loves us, because he created us. Not just you, he loves everyone. That's kind of the idea we have problems with. 
God loves me most. I'm his favorite. And God does love you the most, but he loves the person you don't like as much as well because God's love's not tainted like our love. God loves us and wants to be with us. It's always been that way from Adam and Eve in the garden to Abraham to Moses to Joseph to all David to all through the Bible. You see that God just wants to be with his people to do life, to walk, and to be in relationship because he loves us. It's good news that God loves us. He loves us as we are. God loves us because he's anything. He, he, he loves us because he doesn't need anything from us. He loves us just because he loves us. He loves us. He has no angles. God has no agenda. You ever see people that only call you when they need something? And they're like, uh, and you're like, oh, what do they want? God's not like that. God loves us because God loves us. His love is complete. His love is full. His love is whole. It's not selfish. God is not aloof. God is not disinterested. God is right there involved with us. God loves us immeasurably. God loves us overwhelmingly. God loves us unconditionally. In fact, God loves us with total abandon. Thought about that? God loves you outrageously with total abandon. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is called the love chapter. People look at it. You hear it at weddings many times where they're trying to pledge each other and say this is the love of God that we should have for each other. It's a good goal. It's a difficult one. Verse 5 says that love, for example, does not seek its own. It's a great description of God. God loves us because he loves us. And he's not out for selfish ambitions. God doesn't see us like a big chess game, an eternal chess game where we're pawns and some people are horses and he makes moves and it's about the end game. It's not about the person. God loves each of us and has a unique plan for us. Jesus, how do I know that he loves us? How does he have a plan for us? Well, Jesus came, God's son, down to earth to show us the Father, to show us love, to show us how we can live as humans best. He can show us how he lived a life of love. And Jesus is very clear that to live a life of love, to live a godly life, to live a life like he lived, to live a life that pleases God, is one that not living for self. We are not living for ourselves. He tells us not to focus on our own needs, but to trust God for our needs. Living for ourselves is completely ungodlike. Consider that thought for a moment. Living for ourselves. We tend to view others through our lens, don't we? I mean, Jim's a Tiger Cat fan. I like Jim. Keith is an Argo fan. I can live with Keith. We we see things through our lens. I can love Keith because he's a football fan. Sue in the back sitting there says, I don't care about football, he just lost me, Pastor. But that's okay. We tend to see people through our own lens, and, and we tend to see God through our own lens. You have a stern father that you can never meet the needs of. God's a father who you can't meet the needs of unless you change and learn about God. There are things that we view God with. If we view our lives as self-centered and we please ourselves and we live to do what we want, we won't understand God because he is giving and he is kind. And we can't see that aspect of his character until we start to give and start to change. Personal gratification twists our human hearts. Have you ever seen that? We see it in movies all the time. Somebody pursues something and then Bilbo Baggins finds the ring of evil that rules all the other rings. He takes the ring to Gandalf the wizard. I know all the geeks are really happy right now. And he says, would you take this ring? And Gandalf says, don't even tempt me with it. I don't even want to touch it because he can't handle it. That ring is something in our lives that if we focus on it, it'll twist us and cause us to change and not be like God. We know things that we know are not right. We know on some level it's not always good to be selfish, even though we are, don't we? The cannibal knows that he shouldn't eat other people because he himself doesn't want to be eaten. We don't want other people to be selfish because we want them to care for us. We want them to treat us well, but we necessarily don't treat them. We know things intuitively. But when we focus on these things, then we love things. Jesus said that you you can't love God and mammon. You can't love God and stuff. But we love things, don't we? We live for what? 
We accumulate what? Some of you better not die because your kids will take forever to clean your house out. Too personal? But you can't love God in things. You can't love God in the way the world goes. You have to love God for loving God. So I'm presenting the idea that we have to choose to put God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your mind. This year, when you go through your framework, when you make your decisions, when you make your direction and your choices, has it got God, loving God with all your heart, soul and mind in there, in that consideration? Or is it what you and I want to do? That's the battle I have spiritually. I don't know about you. I do what I want to do, and I wrestle with God because I don't do what God wants me to do. That's the fundamental battle I face. It's not other people that bother me. It's not, it's not the guy who cuts me off on the road that's the problem. It's the fact inside I think I deserve better, and I'm impatient and driving like a maniac. By the way, if you see me, it's not my vehicle. That's why I don't wear a Christian fish or a pastor sign on my car. What do we do? Well, another thing. Our first call in life is to be, isn't it? You know, you've heard it said, Knighton's little saying, we're human beings, not human doings. We are to be, and that's true spiritually. We are to be in relationship with God. We are to walk with God. We are to live life with God. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. We are to be in relationship with God. That's why Paul could survive everything and why he could have joy and be happy. Not only we be, we, we do after that. But So what do we do if God is first? <clears throat> well, we let Christ channel through our lives. We like the bracelets and we like the stickers on the back of the car that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? To remind us that we should choose what Jesus would. Jesus calls us to be light, calls us to be salt, to make a difference, to love others, to not be selfish. So if God is love and sheds his love to us and gives his love to us, we should love what God loves. What does God love? God loves people. Lost people, God loves people of all shapes and sizes, so we should love others and serve others. Hence, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you have to love yourself. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to be with God. God, you're not much function if you're totally incapacitated. So you've got to love yourself, but you also have to love your neighbor. And that's an important thing. So God calls us to live like Christ. To live and serve others and care for them. Our lives are not just about ourselves, our own destiny and what we want. Our lives is about what God is doing and what he's doing in other people's lives. And there's a kingdom that's growing. And we're part of that kingdom. If the goal was just to get you to heaven then when you accepted Christ, he should just kill you on the spot and take you to heaven and get you out of the way. But it's bigger. He has a plan. He wants to work things in our lives. He wants to teach us things and help us to grow. And he wants to touch others. And we are the ones that he uses to touch others as part of that process. God's ways are not our ways. Don't you agree? If we focus on giving instead of taking, we experience Christ's life. We experience joy and fulfillment. We like to say it's better to give than to receive, but there are times if we pushed ourselves, we would not be comfortable with that statement. We're okay giving our, to our kids and all of the people we love and our friends because we love them, but people that are not so acceptable to us, we're not so easily to give. You realize that, right? How many times do you just walk by people and refuse to enter in to the mess? I do it all the time, unfortunately. Now, I can't stop and do it all the time because then I would never get anywhere, but you understand what I'm saying. God's ways are not ours, so you find fulfillment when you do it, God's. That's why Paul didn't seem to mind shipwreck, beatings, beatings, beatings. I'm turning into a black preacher now. Hunger, sleepless nights. I could really go on that. Shipwrecks, beatings, hungers, sleepless nights. But he focuses on Christ and being like Christ. God changes our lives because he's God, because he has power, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with us, and then he does. The problem is, is if we're not in that personal relationship with God, if we're not loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind on an ongoing basis, then our focus changes, and we start to default to other stuff, and our minds wander. Why do we worry? Why do you worry? Because you can't control it? Because it's not working the way you want it to? 
Who's in control? Can you add one inch to your height by worrying? No matter how much I worry, I'll never be as tall and good looking as Doug. Right? Can you add a hair to your head by worrying? No, you could have surgery done, I suppose, but we worry about so many things because we're not happy with the way God does it. Some of us think that it'd be great to have all the money in the world and we wouldn't worry. Ever have that thought? Oh, if I could only make what LeBron James makes for a day. I'd be so happy. I'd pay the church's debt off. I'd give to missionaries. You ever thought something like that? People with wealth and money aren't necessarily any happier than we are. Have you watched the news? What happens to the people who crash and burn with money and wealth and power? Looking for fulfillment. They're looking for fulfillment in money. They're looking for fulfillment in fame. And they crash and burn because they realize it's not in there. They're hollow. They are hollow because it's not God's ways. You want fulfillment, you turn to God and start there. God's ways are not our ways. Jesus said that I came to show the way, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So one of the things he said, above the many, Luke 17, 33, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. In order to keep our life, we have to lose it. That's counterculture. It doesn't go against our common sense of what our society says. But that's the principle that we have, of one of many, that if we're following God, that we need to construct our lives around. God can become hazy. God can become distant. Our knowledge of him can diminish when we become more about ourselves. And we only think about ourselves shuts us down spiritually. Now if we focus on our mission and what we're doing without focusing on our relationship with God, we get out of balance. Our lives become hollow. You know you can't do any work without God. That's spiritual. God, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, apart from me you can do nothing. No matter how many times we try to win an argument with somebody, lead them to Christ, speak peace into their life, whatever we're trying to accomplish, if God's not in it, it's just human effort. God needs to be involved in that. That's why God's got to, you've got to walk with God and you've got to have God daily in your life. I'm going to stop and pause on just a hobby horse. You know the prosperity gospel? Health and wealth gospel. Name it, claim it, nab it, grab it, confess it, possess it. You know the idea that if I'm a Christian, I should always have enough money, I should always be healthy, I can retire, and I'm going to die in my rocking chair, sleeping, not screaming in a burning car fire. I'm just Stay with me here. Come on now. But the idea is there. Now, I don't have a problem with that God wants to bless us. I don't have a problem with that God wants to heal us. I don't have a problem with that, because every good and perfect gift comes from God. Right? But not, God has bigger purposes for us than just healing us and blessing us. Sometimes he wants us to learn more about him by going through suffering. Paul prayed three times that his illness and his thorn in his flesh, he called it, would go away. And God basically said, stop not praying about it. I'm not taking it away. It's good for you because you learn that my grace is sufficient for you. Some people will die of cancer and heart attack. God may not heal you, but through that journey and those lessons that we learn through some of that stuff, God does greater things in our character, in our lives, and through our lives. The thing that gives me peace in all of this is that God only wants what's best for us. And that always isn't being healthy or wealthy. Make you happy? But, but no matter what happens to me and if I'm trusting God, it's okay. Because God only is going to do good and bring good out of it. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean it's not painful. It doesn't mean it's, it's devastating. It does mean God will be with us. Walking with God matters. And then doing stuff for God matters, but we need to do it with Him in our lives, not just as acts separately. I mean, most of us think we're owed a good life. Most of us think we are owed comfort, health, and wealth. And that's part of the culture skewing our spiritual values. Those things are not always the best things. 
God has more than our culture has to offer. I believe. Two-sided paper, man. So, we have objectives, and some can be, feel small and self-centered. Take a look at Matthew 6, 30 to 33 as a point. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, ever looked at the grass of the field and how beautifully green it is, or the wheat in the field? I love the color of wheat in the fall when they have it, watching the wind and the sun go on the wheat. I personally like that. I like leaves when they change, and the colors in the leaves. If God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow's thrown in the fall. All those beautiful leaves just get burned or taken away to compost. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, those who don't believe in God, the ungodly, run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you, need, you have need of them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. One of the things Jesus says we change in our view. That if God is first, our views change and we trust God. We don't trust ourselves. We don't necessarily trust what we want. We will trust what God wants. God says that we were chosen before the very foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1. And he had us in mind to bring unity in all, all things in Christ and unity in heaven and on earth. Paul shares over and over the idea, it's all through the Bible, that God's ultimate aim is to be with us, to love us, and to be part of his kingdom. That's what God's desire is. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee, as a pledge, as an assurance, as a deposit that we will go to be with the Lord. It's one of the things that is the reality of having God's presence in your life. God walks with us. God is with us no matter what we face this year. God is with us. We should walk closely with him. I love Romans 8, 28, 29. It's my class verse when I graduated Bible college. And we know that in all things God works for good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. What did he set us up for? What does he want us to be? To be conformed to the image of his son. Not to be like the world, to be like his son. To give, to love, to serve. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Isn't that what Jesus did when he walked? That is what he wants us to do. And that priority is always there and it affects every area of our lives. We are to become like Christ. We are to walk in relationship with God. That brings Christ into our being. When they wrote one of the great catechisms, one of the Westminster catechisms says, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's true. If we're here 80, 90, 92, hopefully another 10 years, Ernie, right? If we're here that long, we will go to meet the Lord and spend eternity with him. That's our chief end, to be with God to glorify him. It's about perspective, an eternal perspective. If we live life with an eternal perspective, how does that change how we live? I mean, consider the way God changed the lives of saints that walked with him. Think about them for a bit. Moses, David, Joseph, and how they worked through, God worked through their lives. Moses was born, uh, was raised miraculously through Pharaoh's family. A miracle the way Moses got into the family and was raised with an education and was prepared and trained in Pharaoh's court and provided for in a miraculous way. And you look at the story, and isn't that great? So here's God training his leader. Moses tries to run ahead of God, kill somebody, trying to free his people, and he's afraid of being called a murderer, and he runs out, and he spends the next 40 years, 40 years watching sheep. What does God do? He builds character in Moses, and character over those 40 years was in particularly one area. He was humble. Probably in Pharaoh's court, being raised in Pharaoh's court, knowing who you are and what you know and the power you have and the education you have and the position and the prestige, you're not so humble. But God's school changed him, and he was humble. He went from this place to this place, and then God calls him back to the original call to, to, to bring people, deliver the people of Israel. He calls him back to the same call, but he's a different person because God's worked in his life. He goes back and he leads the people and he's one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. And what, what made him a great leader? He was humble. He went to God to ask what to do. He went to God for provision. That's what made him a great leader. And his accomplishments are unbelievable. But God did that work. See, God's ways are not our ways. We would have said, get a good education. Get there, it's just all the way up. The trajectory always goes like that. God doesn't do that. 
God sometimes takes us from a place in our lives and puts us in obscurity to teach us something or a place that we need to learn it. And then when character work is done, God has our way, we trust him, and then he puts us back to it. God's ways are not our ways. So when this year, when you look at the things that are happening to you, trust God. Life is about intimacy with God, knowing him. Sometimes we get off that path. We forget about knowing God, and God sometimes does strange things to make us pay attention. I've had people, and it's not a, it's not a rule and thumb, but I've had the thought over 25 years and being a pastor, sometimes people say, Pastor, pray for me because I'm sick. And I'm thinking in my head sometimes, maybe God allowed sickness to slow you down so you'd spend a bit of time with them and refocus. And I have a hard time then praying that they'll get better, thinking God's got something better for them. Just a thought. It's about balance. It's about following God. It's not about sitting and knowing God in isolation, but it's about living for God in our lives everywhere we go, doing his will, doing his purposes, walking with him, following his plans, not our plans. And when we do that, we experience personal joy and peace. That's why Paul could sing in prison in stocks and chains because he had that peace that God was with him he was where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to do and it would be all right God will be with him in 2015 I hope our perspectives change that we trust put God first we realize that there's an eternity because we're going to meet God we live for eternal things not temporal things that pass we focus our eyes and our attention on things that are kingdom things because that's what matters If there's kingdom things, then there's kingdom rewards. Ever thought about that? God says, well done, though, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. There are rewards. There are things and accomplishments. And so sometimes people say, oh, don't talk to me about heavenly rewards because then we're just living for heaven. And oh, that's not very spiritual. But but the reality is, if there's degrees of punishment, then there must be degrees of reward as well. (laughs) Right? In hell and in heaven. God has us do work, and we are given basis on being faithful. And the view is not our view. The person standing up, speaking, may not be the one that's rewarded. It may be the person who's giving a cup of cold water or buying a coffee for somebody in in Tim's that needs one. Our views are skewed when we do that. Anyways, back to where we were in the rewards. If heaven's for real, and we're going to meet God in heaven, then we need to change our lives, and it changes us. For example, uh, the Bible says, Matthew says, records Jesus saying, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Does that mean you're a spaz? No. It means don't broadcast what you're doing. Do it as unto God, and don't go around telling the world. Don't bring your offering up and blow the trumpets and say, here is my big offering. (sighs) Right? It's saying, keep God in your mind says all kinds of great things. Um, I have a list. If you want one, I'll give it to you after. One of the exercises, there are 30 things that Jesus talks about that are eternal. There's 40, actually, probably in Matthew, but 30 are listed here, of things that are suggested. Whoever is godly and teaches others will be great in heaven. Give gifts secretly instead of publicly, and God will reward you in heaven. When you practice self-denial, don't flaunt it. For that's the reward you'll get. Do it secretly for a heavenly reward. Don't accumulate stuff. Add to your bank account in heaven. There's all kinds of things in here. The last one I thought was interesting that I went through. How you treat the nobodies in your life is how you're treating Jesus. Ouch. How you treat the nobodies. Anyways, on the back are some exercises to process some of those things. Process. But, But the idea was is that if there is eternal rewards, if we're living for God, then our lives will change. And each of us struggle with different things. Ever have times that somebody's talking to you and you don't want to talk to them? You don't want to listen to them? You don't want to enter into the mess? Ever done that? Well, how you treat the nobodies of the world is how you treat Jesus. There are people you won't make eye contact with because you don't want to help them. (laughs) It's okay, we all do it. (laughs) Go ahead, look around. Look at the person next to you, and I'm just teasing. Anyways, I picked three of those things to work on this year. I did it Monday, and I already blew all three this week. 
I'm serious. I blew it. I just blew it. I, I just, I'm an idiot. I can call myself an idiot. Not a good idea for you to call me an idiot unless it's a good day. Don't do it on a Monday or else you'll get what I think. <laughs> but it's true. I, I picked three of those things out of this list and I, I blew them before the end of the week. We need to walk with God. We need to change our lives and allow God to change us so that we can live the way He wants to. Why? Part of it is so that He is honored and pleased because we love Him with all our strength and mind. Also, because it makes a difference in the kingdom and it makes a difference to us. Because a life that's doing God's will, doing God's things, is an exciting life. It's a journey. It's got great things. It's not an easy life. It's not all going to be health and wealth and blessings. But it will be worth it. And it will be fulfilling. Colossians is a great passage. 3 and I, is one of the closing verses. Since then you have been raised with Christ. And I like this. Set your heart on things above. We have to be careful what we set our hearts on. We should set our th- hearts on God. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. We are to set our minds on God. And on Christ and on his word. And let it change us. Jesus said, Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's all there. God first. Eternity and mission, loving others and serving others. With eternity in mind is loving your neighbors. And yourself is there because when you do what God wants and when you live the way God wants you to live, you are fulfilled and truly being human the way God wants you to live. And you experience joy. Circumstances may not change, but you have joy and peace because God gives it. It's a balanced life. So this year, as you hash out your life, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Big challenge. But it's a good thing. I don't know about you, the last thing I'll say is this. When we get off spiritually, when I get off spiritually, and I struggle and suffer, it's because I've walked away from God somewhat. I'm not necessarily reading God's word, I'm not praying, I'm focused on selfish stuff that I want, and the direction I want to go. And then I begin to drift from God and my heart twists. I think you would find the same if you were honest about it. That's why we need the reminder to always keep coming back to God. Because it's true. And I don't think we can get told it enough. God has to be first in our lives. Because that's the way God made us. And the way it works. In God's kingdom. For your consideration. If you want that exercise, I have them here. You can come up and get it afterwards. If you don't want to get it afterwards and you're embarrassed or... I can email it to you. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that you're so loving and gracious. Help us to love you and keep you in our priorities this year. Uh, Help us as a church to love you and make decisions that honor you and make a difference in this world that please you and honor you as well. But as individuals, Lord, keep calling us back to loving you. I pray for each person and family that are in this room and just ask that you would give them your best that you would give them you and that they would fence your presence, they would continue to grow in you. And we do look forward to a year where at the end of the year we can say we have grown in you and we learned, have learned so much more about you and your ways. Praise you for that. For we pray it in your mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. I went on long. It's because I lost my notes. Thank you for joining our service this morning. We stream every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And of course, you can come and be here live on Sunday morning as well. We look forward to seeing you and connecting with you again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you.